Over to you, Ian. Thank you. We're just still packing them in a little bit. That's good. Thank you, folks. That's awesome. So I'll just kind of run through a bit of a bio before we get started into the uh, cyber mayhem that I have in store for you. Um, DEF CON, who was here was at DEF CON? Anyone make the pilgrimage? Yeah? Awesome. Awesome. I'm sorry if I yelled at you to get in line. Okay? That's my apology right there. Zephyr Fish, is he here? He was his first year at Gooning at the world's largest um, security conference. He did a great job. I'm just going on record and saying that. Um, I get to write for security publications and stuff, and that's, that's fun. Um, one of the things I'm involved in is um, architecting the games and challenges for the UK Cyber Defense Challenge and the Canadian Cyber Defense Challenge. The only difference between the two is that in the Canadian one, we say, I'm sorry that you didn't get that particular um, flag. Um, I've got a book coming out on cybersecurity. I'm hoping to get it launched in December. It's uh, Part of this presentation is going to really talk about that as well with some examples. And I come to security from a law enforcement background, really, with um, some time with the Canadian military police, as well as um, working as a RCMP criminal intelligence analyst. I'm really fascinated by cyber crime and cyber criminals. And I think one of the things that we can talk about is the cyber crime problem is not going away. Um, I pull up these two examples from indictments. Um, uh, Department of Justice um, indictments are actually excellent teaching tools for cybersecurity because an indictment basically lays out the evil Lex Luthor cybercrime plan that the bad guys had um, and then they got caught, which is really great because then we can understand not only how they got caught but also um, what you could do as a small medium business to, de to defend yourself. So these two guys, the first guys are really kind of twits because they broke into PBX systems and basically used them as uh, long distance services and sold them out on the internet. Um, they did this from 1999 to 2014 by the time they were caught. Um, this second group I really like because they went to cybercrime in a really neat way. They decided to buy ads that popped up on people's computers that said, you're infected by a virus you need to call this 1-800 number, and then they sold free antivirus for around 400 US dollars to fix your computer. So they got busted. My point is this, is that these are low-tech attacks and they're not going away. The only thing that we can do um, collectively in, from now and 10 or maybe 20 years forward is really talk about education. And education becomes super important because we continue to see fail on an epic proportion, okay? 200 million identities, including what parties they preferred, were left on a cloud server, no password, no encryption, okay? That's pretty egregious, right? And what's really interesting is how quickly a number of businesses say, oh, that was our subcontractor, or that was our MSP like they're not responsible for that data at all. So I'm hoping that GDPR is a big wallop for these type of organizations that do stuff like put personally identifiable information into cloud servers, mysteriously believing that simply because it's in Amazon, everything will be OK. OK? Everything is not OK. There are a whole bunch of MongoDBs that were set up in Amazon that got pilfered by bad guys because, again, there was no security there. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how performance reviews for cybersecurity go in other countries. Not so good. But context is really important in this. So this particular guy, he was the head of Iran's cyber warfare unit. And as you probably know, there were unleashed a whole bunch of distributed denial service attacks on US banks. Okay, These banks basically had to shore up their defenses and fix their web application vulnerabilities because these uh, SSL type of attacks, exhaustion attacks, and overwhelming the servers caused a lot of people to be unable to access their banking information. Right? So think of it as um, an outsourced BT. You know, when they go down, nobody can do anything. Um, what happened is, is the new prime minister of Iran wanted 
detente with the United States. He wanted to renegotiate. And I feel that this particular guy might have said, no can do, bro. And that's how he got replaced. Now, I say this because in other countries, the performance review process is a little bit different. But the point here is, is that as we go on, cyber, and the big takeaway from my presentation, is what happens in cyber can affect real life. And what happens in real life can affect cyber. So here's an example. And I love to point this one out because it's so exciting to me. These guys were Syrian electronic army operatives working in support of the Assad regime. Okay, Assad is not a particularly nice guy. He, you know, um, does things like, you know, nerve gases his people, things like that. But as you can see in the highlighted portion, this person picked a not a good alias to do his cybercrime. <laughs> and yeah, not only that, they were extorting American businesses, saying that we're with the Syrian Electronic Army. Woo, and we're going to attack your business if you don't pay us money. Now, where their plan came off the rails was they used Facebook accounts and Gmail accounts to try and extort American businesses. I would suggest that probably using a giant American service provider to extort money from American businesses is maybe not the route to go. Like maybe ProtonMail might be a little bit better. But I heard that they just got hacked today. So. One of the reasons why we want to talk about this is the money. There is a lot of money involved in cybersecurity. Okay? So those of you starting your career, you're starting at a really good time. Because there is a lot of growth forecasted by Forbes and everything like that. But let me bring to your attention the $2 trillion in cybercrime forecast. This is not so good um, for us and for everyone. And I think that as time goes on, that two trillion might be a little bit soft. One of the biggest problems, we'll talk about this in a moment, is we don't have any accurate measures of cybercrime. Now, one of the interesting things that we've found is that one of the more lucrative ways of making money online is to simply go to a business and ask them to send you money. This type of attack seems to work particularly well. And what's interesting about it is it cost an Australian defense firm $57 million that they transferred to a Chinese bank because the CEO sent an email to the CFO. Now, you'll be happy to note that the CEO paid the iron price for that and is no longer CEO. And this is what I'm talking about. So these are 2016 numbers from IC3. IC3 is the collective uh, law enforcement database of um, reported cybercrime. What I find very interesting about this is when you have personally been ripped off, you are very interested in reporting cybercrime. So as an example, we see business email compromise that we just talked about, topping the scales at $360 million in losses last year, followed by confidence fraud and romance, okay, followed by non-payment, non-delivery. This stuff is all low tech. This has been around since Roman periods. Okay, But if you look over and you look at malware, scareware, and ransomware at a paltry 2 million, that makes no sense when you contrast that with many vendors' reports that are saying ransomware is a $1 billion problem. So the problem that we have is at the government policy level is we are working with flawed data. And this is why it fell to a 23-year-old IT security researcher with a bad haircut to stop a worldwide ransomware attack. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. One of the other problems that we have with our leaders is massive overreaction to the cyber threat every time terrorists um, do something. And we start talking about things like we're going to outlaw encryption, we're going to drone strike hackers. Um, everybody kind of goes batshit crazy. I'm sorry. I said no potty words. Right. OK. I apologize. I'll, I'll go on. OK. Good. She gave me stink eye right away. Um, the point here is, is that we continue to deal with this situation in absolutely the wrong way, rather than analyzing what the problem is. So in 2017, we see a couple of major trends that are going to be with us moving forward. 
botnet wars, and the evolution of ransomware. And I just kind of run down some of the major attacks. And um, one of the things that was really interesting to me is the versatility of bots for cybercrime. So MethBot was making $5 million a day by basically clicking on videos. Okay, And that was it. But they were fraudulently clicking on because it was a botnet. And so instead of human eyes, it was no eyes. And people were making all kinds of money doing that. We entered into the realm of massive cyber attack. And I'm not talking about ransomware or WannaCry or not PETA. I'm talking about BrickerBot. BrickerBot is really interesting because it destroys poorly protected IoT devices. IoT devices with either vulnerabilities or default passwords. Okay? What was interesting is when a German guy tried to leverage that, he accidentally shut down 1.25 million uh, routers for Deutsche Telekom. And again, he got caught, and he's now you know, going to jail, and that's very exciting. But that heralded a new problem that we had that we never had before, where other devices and mass attacks are capable of rendering our internet on its knees. And we saw this with things like WannaCry. As soon as that NSA malware became available, many antivirus people, many IT providers did not do what was necessary, despite US CERT guidance that said, SMB v1, thou shall not expose it to the internet, thou shall block it at your firewall. And Microsoft said, here's a bunch of patches. 58 days we had. 28 days since the patches were made available. But yet so many businesses suffered, and we'll talk about what that, what that was. Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar, if you don't know what those are, those are NSA malware that came complete with an instruction set on how to use it. Okay? Absolutely, you basically gave, okay, uh, this would be the equivalent of giving every nation on the planet enriched uranium and moving their entire cyber war warfare program forward. The saddest thing in the world, though, is when you look at the eternal blue and you do the reverse analysis, it was simply this, putting a 32-bit value into a 16-bit register. That was the attack. So. My harsh criticism on that, and again, I used the potty mouth in an actual newspaper article, was that this was something that every vendor should have picked up on, every IPS vendor, every IDS vendor, and every IT professional should have paid attention to US CERT. And these guys didn't at all. And they're now going to pay the iron price. I'm sorry if I'm throwing all those um, Game of Thrones references in, but totally addicted to it now. Um, 300 million in loss. Well, two, 300 million to 400 million in losses for that company. Do you think that will change things? I think it will. Because I think if I was the CIO of that company, I would be updating my resume on LinkedIn. Okay. The TNT one, I have a personal connection for it. I showed up to do a conference, and my booth stuff didn't, because TNT had a ransomware attack. The TNT is owned by FedEx, and FedEx basically let all the analysts know that they are going to take a write-down loss on their next quarter results as a result of ransomware. So it is becoming to have real consequences. So. I want to talk a little bit about malware tech. Um, malware tech would be my love child with Jenny Radcliffe. Um, basically, guy stops wanna cry, loses his anonymity as a result of that, goes to DEF CON, has some fun, gets arrested. Please read the indictment if you get your hold on, get your hands on it. Because here's the biggest problem with this indictment. It has basically taken a security researcher and said that actually making stuff for security research purposes is against the law in the United States. This is what they're trying to get through. I don't think they will because Mar Marcia Hoffman is like a Doberman pincher, and she is one of the sharpest lawyers that there is out there that handles hackers. She used to be, I believe, chairperson of the EFF. And this is really one of those 
ex this, this reach by the DOJ. The other problem is, is that there were no victims of the Kronos malware in the United States. So please explain to me how this guy gets arrested for something that didn't affect anybody in the United States and an indictment in Wisconsin gets spooled up. So I'm hoping that they crush it. So going to a more cheery topic of uh, 2018, we want to talk about a mass casualty incident that I think it's looking more and more like we're in a very precarious situation. And maybe not actually here in the G20, but in other countries where we've handed our poorly designed tech and moved it down. We've moved the problem to Africa and Latin America in terms of vulnerabilities and critical infrastructure. However, we now have this. All of the cars hackings that were going on at DEF CON. Truly interesting stuff here, where again, security was an afterthought in a lot of these cases. And my boss of the DEF CON goons, Mark Rogers, is known for hacking Teslas. Okay? So there is a lot of hacking. And I'm going to play this. No, I'm going to go back and I'm going to play this video here. I think I can do it here. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. Come on. Come back. Come back, please. Okay. Let's see if I can play this now. Spacebar to play? Yes. All right. So, dash cam recording. I, I, I find this fascinating. And you see that basically in this, there's an autonomous vehicle running a red light. <laughs> that in itself is not necessarily a problem. But here's the problem. What happens if one day all the autonomous vehicles decide to run red lights? That's the issue that we have with the safety. Because if the vulnerability is in one vehicle, given at certain particular circumstances, enterprising young hackers may find a way to affect an entire fleet of vehicles. And this is some of the stuff that we are talking about now in the ICS transportation world, simply because this is pertinent to our daily lives. Because running, being run over by an autonomous vehicle is going to be not good. Okay? So, in 2019, I thought about maybe we would have a cyber war, but maybe it's actually started already. So, electile dysfunction <laughs> is a serious issue of which you can get drugs for on the internet. <laughs> but we have seen a pattern of damaging the credibility of the various parties involved and in the elections. So, we saw email servers being attacked. We see patriotic Russians who somehow decide that um, the United States prefers uh, Trump as president. We see the states versus the executive branch about the voter rolls. And finally, we see a search warrant dropped on DreamHost for the IP address logs of anyone on an anti-Trump website. And if that doesn't put a tingle up your spine, it really should, because this is going back to the McCarthy era in the United States, where they make a list of people. They don't need people anymore. They need a list of IP addresses. Okay? So this is where we've gone here, and this is why I think we're so very vulnerable when it comes to social media and fake news and meddlesome in democracies. And this is the classic example, where quite literally one hacker and at first the United States thought it was the UAE, but then they reversed the position and blamed the Russians, created a crisis in the Middle East by suggesting that the leader of Qatar said things that were pro-Israel and pro-Iran. Okay? And then what happened was Qatar actually hosts one of the largest military bases in there. The reason why they think it was the Russians was that they wanted to destabilize that relationship between Qatar and the United States. And then we have the other problems out there. We have a very interesting APT-style attack where a fake person was created to actually befriend folks working in the oil and gas industry 
This was attributed to an APT group called Cobalt Gypsy or Twisted Kitten. I think Twisted Kitten is an awesome APT name. I'd want to work for Twisted Kitten. I'll get a shirt and everything. Um, the idea here was using a catfish style attack. Okay, Again, something that we will have moving forward. Which is also why I think malware attack might have gotten into some trouble because after five or six shots um, talking about you know fun things in Vegas, to be perfectly honest, he's 23, and if a really good-looking lady was sitting down beside him, ooh, you're malware attack, I can see where that went. It turns out her initials were FBI, but that, you know, <laughs> oops. So when we talk about what cyber war looks like at a kinetic level, that we can go back in history and see a whole bunch of different attacks that happened. Uh, pipeline explosion, um, alleged pipeline explosion in 2008. The attacks, the data destruction attacks on Saudi Aramco, uh, Shamoon, uh, and Shamoon 2. Tunnel lights in Haifa, Israel, which were turned on green at both ends. Okay, Caused a little bit of a traffic jam, but wasn't you know a mass attack. Um, the... <laughs> My favorite was the really angry guy that let loose thousands of gallons of sewage back in 2001 in Australia, caused millions of dollars in cleanup. Uh, we had Trick from Team Poison, who then went on to the Cyber Caliphate, who launched a series of ransomware attacks, including allegedly the one on the hospital. And you know the Ukrainians are having a rough time keeping the lights on in their country and national infrastructure attacks. We can see examples of that. When people ask me, Ian, what does cyber war look like? I said, all of this plus more in one weekend. Usually a long weekend, just after you've turned the lights out in the office. That's what cyber war looks like. So I think at some point we're going to have to deal with this and we're going to have to have some treaties. We're going to have to put in some controls on cyber warfare. And we see this because we're seeing a whole bunch of offensive tools dumped out there with no regard whatsoever for who could actually start using them. And we just saw a double pulsar used again by an APT group to spy on people um, that were going to luxury hotels. Okay? Um, I think we are not approaching this the right way because we're looking at the internet as something that can be managed by countries. And the problem is, is the internet's global. And so I see us evolving into having some sort of way of defending this global thing globally. Because right now, it's hard to get somebody on the phone in Estonia to shut down a BGP route that has now, you know, is now taking the next ransomware attack and spreading it all over. Right? I talked with Lori Love on this quite a bit, and we want to put together a task force that basically says, if we see 4,000 uh, infections in five minutes, we want to push those places off the internet. We want to put a BGP or a, a update and black hole them. Just like Pakistan did to itself when they put out a BGP route update for um, YouTube, and, and it was to some farmer's cable modem, and they crushed themselves. They put themselves off the internet for like four or five hours. Um, so I think we're going to get a second cyber war, because wars seem to always come in twos, and it's because we're doing this. And. Elon Musk and a bunch of other people, um, Shane Legg, who is probably a super killjoy at any party, who basically says, yeah, you know what, I think we're probably going to get um, <laughs> annihilated <laughs> by technology. <laughs> now, obviously, that probably doesn't go over particularly well, but I want to bring your attention to this video, and I hope I can play this one with more success here than I had last time. Um, okay, so can I? Oh, yeah. Okay, I might have even mastered this. So this originally had some had some music um, to just like perk everybody up here, but um, what we're seeing here is um, a little Russian robot, and it basically broke out of its lab <laughs> and wanted to meet people. It was programmed to meet people, right? Now this is really hilarious because it ran out of battery power and stopped in the middle of the street. And you'll see shortly there's a police guy and then the scientist. And he's now um, rolling it back. OK. Now, this is funny, right? But here's the problem. This was the second time this robot did this after a complete wipe of its firmware. So that's a problem, because they can't figure out why it breaks out of its compound and goes to try and meet people. 
there's more that we're going to get into of, of what we're seeing. So in 2022, I'm talking about social hacktivism now becomes a real major issue. And there's a number of things that I think are going to drive this, starting with this. Transportation and logistics. This um, is a lumber ship that docked in British Columbia. And back in the day of around, say, the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s, in order to get a ship loaded and moved, you're talking about 150 people at least. Okay? There's four people that load and unload this ship now because it's all automated. That's it. And you only need three crew pe people to move this ship. They work in shifts because it's got built-in navigation system. So really, all you're paying somebody to do is steer it off the rocks if the navigation system goes, or goes down. So what is that going to do? Well, we're going to see job loss across the spectrum. And I've got some numbers about that uh, in a little bit. Transportation and logistics, it turns out, are a huge part of the gross domestic product of most G20 countries. So we're going to see the automobile loan industry take a huge hit because why buy a car when we have autonomous vehicles everywhere, right? The automobile insurance industry, why would we need to buy insurance if we are using autonomous vehicles all the time? Municipal impacts, no more parking ticket revenue, no more speeding fines because you're in an autonomous vehicle, and autonomous vehicles only occasionally break the law, and if they do, then we'll blame hackers. Um, no more need for traffic enforcement, right? Travel services and roadside infrastructures no longer really need it, but alcohol sales will go way up, because you can get bombed, get into the autonomous vehicle, and you then continue the party in the autonomous vehicle, so that's good news. So I've got another video here, and this just shows some really interesting um, robots working in China. Where I have to underscore, in China, labor is very, very cheap. Very cheap. So what you're seeing here is a human really enjoying his job right now. <laughs> and all these guys moving parcels around. And this is where there would be literally hundreds of people potentially working in a logistics place. But now the robots are coming in, and they're basically pushing those jobs out. And yeah, it's great. They can work 24-7 <laughs> and recharge themselves. So this is a problem for, I think, our society in that we're excited about this possibility, but we're not thinking about the social consequences uh, moving forward. And I find it fascinating that we're plunging ourselves into this sort of dystopian scenario without really thinking through the impact. And this is where one of the impacts are, is that those jobs that you would get out of high school to get some experience and stuff like that are disappearing because they're so automated. Anyone been to a McDonald's lately, the new one, where you just order your thing, right? Anyone notice the staff headcount has gone way, way down, way down dramatically. So here's one of the biggest problems that we have, Daleks. Uh, Daleks. No, we had a guy who's working on a factory floor turned into paste by a robot. and. The problem with that is, as you can see, the uh, defendants in this particular case are numerous. The question becomes, if a robot kills you, because this is a wrongful death suit, who's responsible? And the problem is, is that the lawyers will argue about the percentage of responsibility based across the defendants. So while this is tied up in court and there's tons of arguments, there's a dead person that isn't, that it's questionable as to who's going to compensate that particular person. Yeah, and General Motors wants to put 30,000 factory robots on the internet. So I see a bit of a problem with that, because it's a two millimeter problem. I was, I was really lucky to talk to a CIO of Fiat, and he talked about what his biggest fear was, and it was a car that goes off the line missing a screw. And he said that because the amount of product recall 
that a manufacturer will need to make if a system's integrity is violated by hackers or by a software mistake is huge. I strongly urge you to look up um, S4X17 Vienna um, and look for the keynote on I Hacked My Heart. It is an amazing tale of a medical device, a person that had a medical device in them, and their struggle to understand exactly what software was in there because she found a bug. She climbed the stairs, I believe it's at Russell Square, 196 steps up, and at 180 beats per second or per, per minute on her heart, it defaulted to 80, and she collapsed. There was a software bug in side her. So this is what we're talking about, folks, where we get into some really interesting scenarios when we combine software and put it inside people, or we have it directing and building things, and we're not putting in the checks. So here's the problem where we're now building AI, and I've got some really interesting ideas around AI, but we have now robots potentially learning from other robots. Okay, and I just hope that they're not learning things like homicide. Okay, because that's not going to be good for anybody. But this is where it got a little bit strange. When two AIs, controlled by Facebook, AI Bob and AI Alice, this is what they started saying to each other. They invented a code. Now, we don't know what the code is. The code could have been exterminate all the humans. We don't know. But scientists switched it off and said, that's not good. The problem becomes is what happens when we start working at business speed? What happens when these AIs are running factory systems or power systems or transportation systems and they go a little wacky? That's a huge concern, as is this. As you know, especially given my last name, I am a believer in global climate change. I've seen some reports that suggest that that two and a half degree thing is on the um, conservative side, that there could be significantly more. Um, in fact, I saw one hysterical report that came out that said it was going to be 7.5 degrees and half the human race would go missing. But one of our trend analysis is, is that we're seeing that seven jobs are reduced or um, are removed by the um, implementation of industrial robots. And that's a concern with the unemployment and the um, forecasted growth that we're seeing. So we're into this perfect storm where basically that's the answer. So Forrester predicting 24.7 million U.S. jobs or 17% will be lost by 2027 as a result of um, industrialization. Um, a million unemployed business-to-business -business salespeople, um, mostly because we prefer to pay Amazon more money so we can get stuff from them faster, which is a brilliant business model, by the way. Um, they, deal, they will say that automation will create 14.9 million jobs, or about 10%, but that leaves 9.8 million people, or 7% unemployed. So we have this problem that thank you for coming and talking about it with me and participating, because it's something we need to start thinking about. Um, I think we're going to be here pretty quickly, where we have to partition the internet into a trusted network and an untrusted network. I'm not the first person to talk about that, um, but I think because we're putting these devices that affect life safety on something that by its very nature with the protocols is not secure, we have a, a major problem on our hands. But then Elon Musk wants to connect our human brains to the internet, and I, well, let's just say some of you have very filthy minds that I don't want on the internet, okay? So this is a great idea where your identity could be you, but the problem that we have is, is the use cases of the internet. Sometimes we want total anonymity. Other times we want partial anonymity, especially in the case of voting. We don't want people to know what you voted, but we want your vote to be authenticated and counted. And then finally, when we're doing things like banking, for instance, we want 100% authentication and no anonymity at all. 
right? Because anonymity equals you know, bad guy emptying your uh, accounts. So the problem is we have these three crazy use cases and we're using the same technology to try and provide for all of them and that, that in itself is, a, is an issue. Um, and in 2011, Keith Alexander actually floated the idea of these critical services or a dot secure network. And what was interesting is that it was also talked about by guys like Bruce Schneier, who if you know Bruce, you know he is like absolutely anti like government free weed for everybody like he's a great guy okay but when he says you know might be time to look at this issue because of the internet of things and the capacity to do denial service attacks we may need to have something separate in order to keep critical services running um, so in 2024 i'm saying that the cyber war ends right and this is the part which becomes really interesting because our economic models are going to go down in flames because it just doesn't work what we have anymore. We're going to possibly see where the trusted network is something that's a direct human connection. And finally, we're going to see some really strange professions where we're going to have to deal with AI and virtualizations of ourselves and other types of things. Um, Basically, we're into uncharted waters by then. And I think that by 2025, we're going to have that trusted network bring new prosperity of business. Um, it's going to be a hard, a hard go. But I think there's a number of things that are going to um, help us achieve that. A lot of it is really around identity and the use of your identity in your day-to-day -day lives. And the fact that passwords are failing us as a, as a control mechanism and that the move to biometrics is becoming, I think, more and more commonplace. It's interesting, when they did a poll of millennials, millennials were way more interested in having a chip implanted in them than us old codger people. Like, we don't like that. No touchy-touchy. Um, one of the reasons why I think we're going to have to move to that trusted network is when we look at colonization of other planets, everything on that planet becomes a life safety issue. And we cannot be using NTP and BGP and DNS in order to make sure that the airlocks don't open on these, on these colonies. It's interesting because back in 2008, NASA developed a protocol to use over space that looks a lot like IP um, it's really interesting, um, and that they can do a round trip uh, in about uh, eight minutes uh, between uh, Mars and, and, uh, and Earth. So it's called the DTN, and I think it's really something that is going to be interesting because it, it will pave the way to, for us to um, move uh, you know, into, into space because it appears that we can't go anywhere without being able to be on our smartphones. So. Um, 2027, I'm seeing a second cyber war treaty adopted and signed simply because um, things have fallen apart to the point where we are now rebuilding. But there might be an opportunity here to fix this because we might get the big reinstall. It's called the Carrington event. This is where Earth gets smashed by a giant uh, colonial mass injection. And it's like somebody set an EMP, EMP bomb off um, and basically shuts everything down. And then, as you know, when you shut down stuff, um, sometimes it doesn't come back on. Um, this is more of a permanent uh, fry and die scenario um, b due to the power spikes. We'll be fine, but we're going to be rubbing two sticks together to figure out uh, how to make fire. And everybody will be like, do you have signal? Do you, do you have signal? Um, anyways, thanks for listening. Um, I'm glad to take some questions and stuff like that. How much time do we have? Yeah, are we good or 15? Okay, so we'll do five minutes question and then send them on break early. How's that? Anyone have any questions? Concerns? Gonna go, sir. Okay, so do you think people will actually take your pledge as such or just buy insurance? So it's interesting. I think at this small micro level, insurance has a role to play. And I think in litigation, especially around Internet of Things, like when your dishwasher decides to burn down your house. Um, that will be really interesting in terms of how insurance will start putting in standards. Already we're seeing in cyber liability insurance a bunch of due diligence 
um, requirements in order for the insurance to be valid, which is very interesting because if you did all of those things in the first place, you may not need cyber insurance. Um, so yeah, I see the insurance vehicle uh, for individuals and for small business, but one of the problems is how do you insure the entire national power grid, right? You, you can't. And so when we see the attacks going on in the Ukraine, for instance, uh, the Ukrainian service providers, uh, their infrastructure, they, you know, their insurance is the Ukrainian government, right? There was another question somebody had, at the, way at the back. Yes, yeah, so, um, home security or bushcraft. Or bushcraft, yeah. You know, it's interesting, there's a lot of cybersecurity people that are pretty good campers, oddly enough. Um, they get out of the data center once in a while. Um, I think that there will be times when the internet has prolonged outages um, beyond sort of the Dyn DNS issue that we saw, which apparently um, there was a report that came out from a think tank cost the United States something like four billion dollars off its gross domestic product, and I think that's what started the conversation with legislation coming from the U.S. on Internet of Things. There's still some ambiguity. It's a start. I was talking to uh, Professor Dresser about this. It's a start. The problem is, is they're not talking about liability for you know bad Internet of Things. Um, they're talking about the ability for it to be patched and the requirement for setting a non-default password, which are great sort of manufacturing issues that need to be dealt with, but not great in terms of like what is the liability, right? Any other questions? So, and this is our biggest problem because what the UK might want, which now the UK has built a completely untrusted network because we all know that they're gobbling up all of our, uh, all, the, all of the information about our web searches. Um, at some point, whoever it is, the national government bodies, possibly the UN or possibly the main, the, the main people that have the keys to the internet, will sit down and say, you know what, this is something that we have to start doing. So I think it'll be um, a commercial issue, and I think pushing it is that $2 trillion in cybercrime loss. I, I think we could build a better internet for $2 trillion. Seems like a lot of money, right? Anyone? Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, and it is true because um, I put up there a one report from A.T. Kearney that said the entire value chain of the internet is at 5.3 trillion by 2020, and that the cybercrime was going to take two trillion dollars off of that, meaning that's a 33 percent basically tax by cybercrime. If that comes true, why would you want to be on the internet if 33 percent of every dollar you make, you know, could be victimized by cybercrime? I think what we're doing right now as a nation, I think UK is doing a great job of it because of cybersecurity essentials and, and some other stuff, we're pushing the problem to somebody else's neighborhood, right? We're not approaching the problem at a national or an international level, right? And it seems like the United States is all too quickly to arrest people that are doing criminal copyright infringement like the uh, guy that was running Kickass Torrents. Um, yeah, now we can't pirate stuff anymore. Um, but again, he didn't actually break any crime, and I think he was living in Romania at the time, right? So we, we, have, these, we have these moments where it's extrajudicial, uh, mostly led by the United States, but we're not sort of, we don't have an internet governing council that can say, okay, we're going to partition it. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to go. Yeah. Pakistan. Yep. I remember a few years ago, back in President Obama's uh, reign, there was a lot of talk about internet kill switch. And yes. I had this finger on the button by black calling all BGP routes. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that a uh, cyber war, cyber weapon in your eyes? And, yeah. Um, it's only, well, what do you think? USA holding that finger on the button. So, and this is, and this is why I say, yeah, it, the problem becomes right now, most of the internet traffic that we have, I think it's 70 to 80% is routed through the United States. If the United States decides 
to turn off the internet, they can. Uh, I think it would be a gross political act, and I think there would be ramifications of the of the UN. But in an extringent circumstance where we do have, you know, not Petya running like rampant, and we knew that patient zero for not Petya was the Ukraine, where most of the infection started and then spread out. Um, if we could have, in time, called the telcos of the Ukraine and said, "You guys need to drop your kill switch and shut down because." you're unleashing something lethal uh, on the internet, um, it, it's time to have that discussion and dialogue. Uh, I think there are extringent circumstances where you do need to be able to um, at least filter, right? And you know the attack, um, you know the attack pattern, and you need to block that stuff at the provider level. Well, if you have self-driving cars connected to a cloud service, yep. someone pushes that bunch of black holes, the whole state of California. Exactly. Exactly, right? The ramifications are something that we'd have to figure out. So we're going to have to be able to figure out what we can turn off and what we can't turn off, right? It, it's not as simple as the old days where it was hydro. The lights are on and the lights are off. Some of the lights need to be on and others need to be off, right? You can't shut down an entire hospital um, you know, because of a ransomware attack that's happening in another country. So. Way, way, way at the back. Yeah, definitely. So what's gone on in a lot of cases in Africa and the Middle East and places like that, a lot of the technology has been hand-me-down. And that stuff is going to start coming out and newer stuff is going to start going in as these countries become more prosperous. I think the real issue, though, is, is that infrastructure issue that those countries have right now, most of them aren't doing wired infrastructure. It's all wireless, and that has a whole different attack surface. Um, than, than what we have as a traditional kind of wired backbone internet. Um, and I think the other problem too is that um, as um, more of the world is divvied up into um, fiber providers, so Facebook is laying their own fiber, Google is laying their own fiber, connecting Australia to, um, to uh, the, the Middle East, um, we now have a problem of, okay, um, how do we interact at a nation state level and say, you know, we need access to that lawfully or legally, or we need to fix a problem because we need to route some traffic across your fiber uh, because we've lost, you know, the publicly owned uh, fiber. So we're going to see a whole bunch of challenges in that regard. We're going to see a lot more automation go into Latin America and South America uh, and, and certainly in the Africa area and that automation is going to be problematic from, from an infrastructure perspective. Um, one of the reasons why 5G, for instance, is being talked about so widely is exactly the autonomous vehicles demands on bandwidth. Right now, a single autonomous vehicle is um, using quite a significant amount of bandwidth. If you fill a road with them, uh, you, can, you can imagine that that particular cell phone tower may be, it may be very difficult for that cell phone tower to keep up with the amount of data that those autonomous vehicles are using. So I think that's it, right? Are we wrapped? Time for Scott Helm. Hold on to your seats. If you think I'm funny, this guy, I'm telling you. <laughs>